Would you join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. David Fagoyo? Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> well, brother, we are so welcome. We're so thankful to have you here. It's an honor to have you take our stage. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing what God has put in your heart to share with us today as you bring the word. Thank Amen. you very much. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Blessings. Hello, Rocky Peak. Hello. This is a great place, and uh, you are such a great people. And I want to let you know that you are doing a lot out there and you have been a blessing to us in Uganda and in South Sudan. Uh, you have sent us your church leaders, your church members who have gone to be with us there like to just, you know, add into what we are doing, expanding the kingdom of God in Uganda and in Africa. I am very grateful that I'm here today with you to worship together with you and to share the word of God with you. Um, I was here two years ago, but it was not on a Sunday, it was in the middle of the week, and I just got to come and see the church and facilities and um, what you people do here, and I, ve I was very grateful to God that God is actually doing his work at Rocky Peak. Not knowing that two years, maybe after, I will come and share the word of God with you. So I come from Uganda, just the way you heard from Pastor Michael, and uh, originally I'm from South Sudan, but working uh, and living in Uganda. Um, I have been one of those people who actually go online to see what Rocky Peak is doing, and uh, also listening to some of your sermons and all that, and I understand you have been going through a series titled Five Steps to Success. And last week you read from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 9. And uh, as I was listening to that, I actually thought, you know what, I, I want to just continue from where you stopped last time, but not necessarily talking about success, but talking about something related to what you read in, this, in, in the passage, Philippians chapter 4. Verse 6 was saying this, Do not worry about anything, but pray about everything. Do not worry about anything, but pray about everything. Am I clear? Yes. Yeah, sometimes you know my African accent, I'm not sure whether you are getting me or not, <laughs> so I wanted to make sure. So that, that, that's, that was you, the sermon last week. Uh, I am not going to concentrate on the first part, which is about worry, but the second part, which is about prayer. I am going to talk about prayer or to teach about prayer this morning. And um, it's not going to be just prayer, but submitting our will to God in prayer. That's the title of my sermon. Submitting our will to God in prayer. This message is not about letting you know something you do not know. It is about encouraging you to do something you already know. Prayer. I always tell people, the messages on every Sunday are not only about, you know, getting us to know new things, new experiences. No. Sometimes it's just a reminder. When you read the Bible, the words of Jesus, the letters of Paul, many of those were a reminder to the audience, not necessarily a new thing. So what I'm doing this morning is not to bring you a new topic because I believe all of you know what prayer is, all of you understand why prayer is important, but what I am sharing with you this morning is just a message of encouragement so that we could be a people who pray more, so that we could be a people who know how to have this great relationship with God through prayer. So that's the message this morning, okay? So it's not a new thing, it's just an encouragement to us to practice it more. Sometimes you need someone to tell you you are great, even if you know you are great. 
So this is what I'm doing this morning. Yeah. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 26. That's my main passage. Matthew 26, verses 36 to 46. Matthew 26, 36 to 46. From the NIV. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and two of uh, two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going little, a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Prayer for a Christian is like blood, you know, in the system of every human being. You have a good blood, you have a clean blood, you are healthy. You have a contaminated blood, you are sick. In the same way, a Christian who prays, who has fellowship with God in prayer, is spiritually healthy. Any Christian who is not having any kind of fellowship, like fellowship with God in prayer, is spiritually dry and will eventually die spiritually. Why? Because there is no fellowship with God. Prayer is not only about talking to God. I teach uh, in our university, I do teach, and this is what I ask my students. I ask them, what's prayer? Many of them, or sometimes all of them, actually answer and say, prayer is talking to God. And I always tell them, this is a 50% answer. It is not 100%. I tell them, prayer is not only talking to God. Prayer is about talking to God and also listening. You talk to him and you hear from him. There is no point in me talking to God and I go away without hearing from him. This is not fellowship. Fellowship is not about one person talking and the other one listening. It's about you talk, you stop, I talk, you stop. Okay? You listen to me and I listen to you. This is fellowship. I don't talk all the time. Many of us are in the habit of we talk to God. By the time God wants to talk to us, we are gone. He don't get to find us to talk to us. Prayer is about talking to God and also listening to God, hearing from him what he has for us. So prayer should be a daily habit. Jesus and Paul prayed and encouraged continual prayer. For example, in Luke 22, verse 39, Luke says this, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. If you read the subsequent verses, it actually says that Jesus called them to pray and also he went to pray. So it was his habit to go and pray. 
he also let his disciples see him pray. In Luke 18, 1, Luke also says this, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. If you read the parable, it's about giving, you know, giving the idea that we need to pray continually. We need to be a people of prayer. You read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul says, pray continually. Paul prayed. Jesus prayed. Jesus taught about prayer. Paul also taught about prayer. These great men prayed. And also they encouraged their followers to pray. If Jesus, our Father, our Lord, was actually able to teach his disciples to pray and to pray, then this gives us the idea that God actually wants us to be in the business of prayer. Not because God needs our prayer, because God knows through prayer we have a fellowship with him and through that fellowship we become the people he wants us to be. A Christian will always be strong spiritually if they pray. There is nothing like intellectual Christianity. Whereby you figure out things, you know, you just reason. You just say things, but you don't practice things. Prayer is not an idea. Prayer is an experience. Through fellowship with God. There are people who have not gone to school that much. They don't have the knowledge we have. But when they, it comes to prayer, they know how to fellowship with God. And this is what we see with the disciples. Jesus knew these guys, many of them had not been to school. They were not like Paul. But Jesus wanted them to have this experience of knowing how to pray and having fellowship with God. Because this is then when they were going to be the people God wanted them to be. And it was so serious and so important. Life and this world are contaminated. But prayer helps us draw closer to God and it gives us the ability to resist or avoid the contaminations of this world. But we have a problem as Christians. Christians today learn and talk about prayer more than they actually do pray. We know about prayer. We can talk about prayer the whole day. We can tell the, tell the wonderful things that prayer can do. But when it comes to prayer, we don't pray. It's usually the problem, the big problem that we have. And Christians are lazy when it comes to prayer. I always tell people like this in the church. There are things that happen that tells me, hmm, the enemy is really against prayer. Because when you go to church, hey church, let's stand and worship God in songs. And you know we praise God in songs, through songs. People are happy, people are joyful and all that. They can listen to someone, all this they can do. But ask the church to spend two, three minutes in prayer. The mood changes. Okay? People begin to feel pain in their bodies. People begin to, you know, kind of feel like it's boring in here. Why does that happen when it comes to prayer? The enemy knows the greatest weapon in your hand is prayer. If you are prayerful, you are going to know how to deal with the enemy. But because of that, the enemy actually tells you, you know what? It's cool to go to church. It's cool to praise God. It's cool to listen to the, to the word of God, to the sermons. It's cool to behave as a, like a Christian. But, but don't spend time in prayer. It don't. That's what the enemy does. And many Christians today actually have forgotten to pray. Many of us do not pray anymore. You wake up in the morning, you just go and do your business. You just go and sleep and sleep. You don't have time to pray. We have forgotten that. And the enemy is saying, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> because Christians are no longer praying. But here we are seeing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ praying and encouraging the disciples to pray. 
You will never be the Christian you are supposed to be if you do not pray. You will not have a strong relationship with God if you do not pray. It will only come through prayer. When prayer becomes our habit. Now back to Matthew 26. The passage that we have just read. This passage depic, you know, depicts Jesus in his low moment. Humanly speaking, Jesus was down. He was so sorrowful. He was troubled. He was in his low moment. Like he was going through a lot. He was carrying a burden. And it was so tough for him. When I always read this passage, I feel the pain in which Jesus was. It's like this movie called Titanic. I watched Titanic some years ago. You know, when I began watching the movie, it was so good. You know, this great ship. Very big, huge, and people are entering it, and people are, are happy, you know. I just said, oh, people are going to have, you know, a story to tell after this journey because it was going to be a very good experience. People entered, and they, they, they began sailing, and wonderful things were happening in the Titanic. In some hours, the great ship hit an iceberg. The ship gets a hole. Water begins to flow into the ship. And the people do not know what is going on. They are there celebrating. The water is entering the ship. People are celebrating. In fact, there was a party that evening or that day. There were people discussing business. Jack and Rose were in their own world. <laughs> it was so great. Titanic. As I was watching, I just said, these people don't know what's going on. But in a few minutes, they began realizing, no, there is something. There is a problem coming. Not soon after this, everyone knew death was coming. We are sinking. The great ship is sinking. They knew death were com was coming. Some of them committed suicide. Some of them jumped into the ocean. Some of them, you know, uh, prayed. Some of them cried. Some of them sat and just waited for death. It happened. It was so sad to see this happening to the great ship and the thousands of people on board. There is also another movie, Hotel Rwanda. That movie is about the genocide of, of 1994 in Rwanda. You watch it, it is so terrible. There are people targeting another, uh, one group targeting another group, and people are, you know, are in a hotel. Some of them are in churches, and there are enemies out there looking for them to kill them. I felt so bad watching that. You know, this is the kind of situation we find Jesus in. He was in a moment that was really very, very hard and tough even on him. He needed help. Jesus needed help. Now there are four lessons that we are going to learn from Jesus from this passage. Four lessons, and they are very, very important lessons for us. Lesson number one. Pray when you are sorrowful or when you sense danger or even when you are disappointed. Pray when you are sorrowful, when you sense danger or when even you are disappointed. Verses 36 to 38 says this, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Jesus was going through a very difficult time, but yet he committed himself into prayer. Jesus prayed. In this single you know, passage alone, Jesus prayed three times. 
In verse 36, actually, we see Jesus praying because he said, this is what he says, uh, 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 Matthew says, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. Jesus pray. And also we read in verse 39, it says, going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. In verse 44, it says, verse 44 says, so he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time. In this single passage, in this moment alone, Jesus prayed three times. It was a difficult moment for him, but he knew that prayer was the right thing to do. Many of us today have lost you know, the, the, the right track. We have lost the way to our Father when we are in trouble. We have built around us, you know, places and people that we run to when we are in trouble. Some of us depend on the police when we are in, the, in trouble. We think of the firefighters. We think of our spouses. We think of, you know, the UN, United Nations. We think of so many organizations we, we have built for ourselves insurance here and there so that one day if I'm in, in, I'm, I'm in a problem, I will run there. We have built that around us that when I am in a problem, I will run to this person, I will run to this department. And we have forgotten to run to God when we are in trouble. Church, there are problems that human beings will never solve, only God. When hurricanes come, even the government doesn't have anything to do with it. When we have the earthquake, nobody can stop it. There are things that we cannot do. We have actually watched our beloved people die and we have been unable to rescue and save them from death. They die as we see them. But our God is able to do everything, anything, anytime. But you know, there is this thing that is happening to us like we no longer hope in God. We no longer put our trust in him. We run somewhere else for help when we are in trouble. But I am here to remind us that God is the only one who can be the solution to the biggest problems that we have in our lives. Because, because we do not hope in God, we even don't pray to him when we are in trouble. Someone is sick, is having cancer. Someone is having a problem. A, a disaster is happening somewhere. We have forgotten even to run to God in prayer. I don't know how many people who prayed for the fire in California. Many of us, including Christians, we thought, you know what? Let's think of what we can do. Let's think of how we can put the fire off, which is a very good thing. But how many of us actually prayed and said, God, you know what? This can be beyond the ability of the government but I am depending on you, God. May you do something. God still does miracles even today. He works. We need to relate with him, to have fellowship with him. He works. And he does great things. We need to depend on God. That was lesson number one from Jesus. Lesson number two. Ask people to pray with you. Ask people to pray with you. In verse 38, part B, it says, Jesus said this, Stay here and keep watch with me. Stay here and pray with me. This is what Jesus was saying. I, I need you. I need your prayer right now. Stay here and pray with me. In verse 40, it says, Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. He said, could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? Can't you be awake for one hour just, just for my sake? I want you to pray with me. This is the question he was asking Peter and the rest of the disciples. I want someone to pray with me. Keep watch with me. So we learn from that that it's good to ask people to pray with us. And Jesus did it. We need people to pray with us. You know, there is something that happened in our churches today. 
We are used to this phrase or this statement. I am praying with you. Brother, you are in my prayer. We say that. Many of us say that when we actually do not pray for the people we promise to pray for. It's kind of a common phrase among Christians. I am praying with you. It has happened to me. I will tell someone, you know what? I'm, I am with you in prayer. Then a few months later I will remember I promised someone that I am with him or with her in prayer, but I have never actually prayed for them. It happens. It has become a phrase which we say, a statement which we say as Christians. It is something that we hear in the churches. You know what? I am with you in prayer. Brother, I am standing with you in prayer. But we actually don't pray for them. Prayer is something we say we do, but we don't do. We promise people that we pray for them, but we do not pray for them. Jesus needed the prayer of the disciples right there. He was telling them, I, I need people. I need you. I want you to actually pray with me right now. I need the prayer right now. There are people with us in our churches who are broken hearted, who are going through a lot of problems. And usually when they reach out to us, what they hear from us is, I am going to be praying for you. Like, I am not ready to pray for you now. I am going to be praying for you. And we don't actually pray for them. And they remain the way they are. For Christ's sake. Let's agree we change that today. Amen? Amen. We, when we promise to pray, we actually do what? Pray. That will be a very good thing. Let's change that. One thing I have also seen in our churches is that people tell us to pray about them or for them and we don't pray for them but we take the prayer request somewhere else. You know, we gossip about them in the name of prayer. You know what? Let's pray for David. He tells, me, he tells me that he's actually struggling with addiction. Let's pray for him. But your intention is not to really ask the people to pray for David. Your intention is to gossip about David. You want them to know that David is, you know, struggling with addiction. Because of that, many people actually have Stopped coming to us asking for prayer because in, they know the moment I'm going to ask him to pray for me, he's going to tell someone else. And I don't want that. Jesus needed the prayer from his disciples. Now, this is what I want to tell you. Jesus was doing this for our sake. Jesus was God. He was able to do everything, but there are things Jesus had allowed himself to go through so that we could learn from him. Here he was telling his disciples, you know what? Even a master one day will need prayer. Even a boss, even a CEO, even a senior pastor, even a bishop one day is in need of other people's prayer. Don't think you don't need anyone. You know, in Africa, men are everything. A man is told when he is young that you are a man. You need to be strong. You know, nothing can defeat you. You can do everything. You can do all things. And men grow like that then it becomes hard for a man to say, I am sorry, it was my mistake. Because you are told you know everything, you are able to do everything, you are not weak, you are not supposed to say you are sorry. But as an African man, when I read this, I see something different. My master is telling his disciples, I need you. Stand with me in prayer. Pray with me. Now, Remember Jesus was asking them to pray with him, not to pray for him. It's not a bad, a bad thing for us to ask people to pray for us. But this is what I want to say. It is always good to actually ask people to pray with you. There is a difference between praying for me and praying with me. Praying for me is like, I am not praying, I am there enjoying myself, but you do the prayer for me. 
But, but praying with me means I am in this prayer. I am in it already. But I want you to join me. This is what Jesus is teaching us here. He was already praying and he came, you know, like three times asking his disciples, can you please pray with me? I am also praying. Wake up. Don't sleep. Pray with me. So we need to pray while asking people to pray with us. Don't be this kind of a Christian who asks people to pray for you and you are there sitting and just relaxing. No. <laughs> pray. Let them pray with you. Lesson number three from Jesus. Pray so you do not fall into temptation. Pray so you do not fall into temptation. Jesus said this in verse 41. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Temptations are everywhere, every day. You know, there are some people in Africa who actually think that there are less temptation in the USA. <laughs> or maybe there are weaker temptations in America. And maybe there are people here who think that maybe Africa is better. But out of my experience, temptations are the same everywhere. They may have different versions, but they are the same. They have the same power. They have the same source. They can take us to the same place where they want to take us to. Jesus said, Pray so that you do not fall into temptation. Many of us are in the habit of falling into temptation every day. One big reason is we do not pray. It is through prayer, which is actually fellowship with God, that you can be able to be strong enough to face temptation and actually overcome temptation. You will only overcome temptation if you have the spiritual energy in you. And that spiritual energy will only come through the fellowship you have with God. You have fellowship with God, you are spiritually strong. You don't have fellowship with God, you are spiritually weak. The weaker you are, the more temptation you fall into on a daily basis. But you have this fellowship with God, a strong fellowship with God. And this is why Jesus kept on praying. It was his habit to just show us and let us know if you are in the habit of praying, having fellowship with your father through prayer, you will have the energy, the spiritual energy in you to actually defeat and overcome temptation. Temptations are powerful. They are powerful than us. If you do not have God in your life, if you do not have this fellowship whereby God strengthens you every day, you will be falling into temptation on a daily basis. And this is what temptation is. Temptation actually is like, you know what, I know this is what God wants me to do. But there is something in me which is pushing me the other direction. Jesus knew temptation was coming. And the temptation was, Jesus knew very well that God, his father, wanted him to go through this so that we could be saved. But there was a strong feeling in him which was telling him, no, 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 no. You go this other direction. And he knew this was the greatest time for temptation. You know, Jesus was tempted before to turn a stone into bread. He was hungry. You know, hunger is nothing big. But death was really a very big thing. Jesus was seeing death coming and there was an opportunity of him to go the other, the other road using the other way and he knew that was the temptation. And he prayed to his father. And he asked disciples to pray and told them, you know what, if we do not pray, temptation is coming, if we do not pray, it's going to be hard. Pray so that you do not fall into temptation. Sometimes we have these things in us. We know the will of God. And we know what God wants. But there is a very strong will in us which is pulling us to the other direction. And this is temptation. It's only through God, fellowship with God, that this thing can be broken and you can say actually, no, I know this road, this way is hard, but I'm going to use it. 
because this is where God wants me to go. If not, you will always be going the shortcut, the short way, because this is temptation. It's powerful. You cannot say no to temptation. You will find yourself doing the same thing. You will find yourself wallowing in the same sin because there is no fellowship between you and your father. Remember, it is your father who can give you the power to overcome. And that power can only come if you have fellowship with your father. If you are lazy to pray, be ready to fall into temptation every day. If you do not pray, be ready for all the temptation to come on you and you will not be able to say no. Temptation comes to everybody, but only those who have fellowship with God through prayer who can actually say no to temptation, who can actually defeat, who can actually overcome the temptation. And this is what we see here from Jesus. He prayed. If there was anyone in this world who did not need to pray, this person was Jesus. But here he is praying. Who are you to say I'm strong enough, I'm not going to pray but I will be cool? There is no being cool without prayer. Okay? Because these days, these days we hear these phrases like, I'm, no, you know, I'm not, I'm not this kind of a Christian who prays a lot. I'm not this kind of Christian who is really into ministry. I'm just a cool Christian. <laughs> there is nothing like that. We don't have cool people in the Bible. There are no cool disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay, We have to be aggressive in one way or the other. Actually, spiritual journey is an aggressive journey whereby you fight your way to get to where you want to be, knowing that your father is pulling you there. And this will come through the fellowship you have with God. Amen. That was lesson number? Now, let, let me ask you, what was lesson number one? Good. Lesson number two. Good. Lesson number three. Wow. I, I, I am learning from you. You are also <laughs> preaching. <laughs> Good. Lesson number four. Submit your will to God. Submit your will to God. And this is the heart of prayer here what we are seeing Jesus doing. Submit your will to God. In all he was going through, Jesus submitted his will to the Father and let the will of the Father take preeminence in his life. Verses 39 and 42. 39 says this, Going a little further, he fell with his face on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is not possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. In verse 42, he went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, May your will be done. Are you seeing what Jesus is going through here? Jesus is kind of saying, you know what? I am, I am, I am in trouble here. I am sorrowful. I am down. I know my father wants me to go this road. And I actually know it is so hard to go through this road. I am asking you, my father, I really don't want this. Honestly speaking, I really don't want it. It's beyond me. It's, it's, it's so tough on me. I, I don't want it. But if you will that I must go through it, let it be. And this is the heart of prayer, submitting our will to God in prayer. Why are you know? Why are God is taking you? What God wants you to do is actually the hardest thing you could ever do in this life. And yet you say, you know what, Father? It is not making sense to me. I know it's very hard. I know that road is not 
good, but because you want me to go through it, Father, let it be. That's the prayer Jesus was praying here. You know that you have, you know, your will is contrary to the will of God. You really have a strong feeling that you don't want this. And at the same time, you know this is what God wants you to do. This is what God wants you to go through. This is the right time to submit your will to God. Actually, when pressure comes on us, this is the right time to submit our will to God. Jesus had this pressure coming on him. The pressure was death was coming. A problem was coming. You are going to die. It's going to be very painful. You are going to go through all this. Jesus, it's too much. Please don't go there. And yet he knew that was the way. He prayed and said, Father, I know it's hard, but I'm, I, I am asking you. Let it not be this way. If, but if there is no other way you want me to just go, and I must go through this way, let it be. Sometimes we need to go God's way, even when God's way is painful. God's way always is the best. It may be painful for some time, but the result is very good. Because Jesus chose this to go through this way, we have the salvation. He died for us. If he chose to go the other way and say, Father, you know what? That business is tough for me. I am not going there. There would be no salvation for us through Jesus. Sometimes God is calling people to go this direction, and some of us are actually avoiding that. I did theology and biblical studies. When I was in high school, finishing high school, my family, my family, including myself, thought I was going to become a medical doctor. I was very good in mathematics. I was very good in physics, biology, chemistry. I was like one of the best students in my school. And I thought I was going to be a great physician, a great medical doctor. But not soon after that, I began to feel like God is calling me to go the other direction, to do theology. And theology in my community was for, for, for the weakest. You know, it was like for, for people of no value. And here is a young man who is bright in his school, is choosing theology. Many people called me and said, what's wrong with you? But I knew God was preparing me for something. And the fact that God is using me today to train the church leadership in South Sudan, in Uganda, and across Africa, I know that God was preparing me for that. It was against my will at that moment, but today I enjoy it, and I say, God, you have actually made me choose the path which is better for me, and I love it. Many a time God will call you. God is calling so many people in this place here to step out, to do something. But you know, your will is contrary to God's will. You are feeling, God, no, 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 God, not me. No, no, not me. I am not going there. And God has kept on saying, it is you. I am talking to you. I am talking to your heart. I want you to go this way, not that way. And you have been in conflict with God because of that. Today, God is teaching us through his son, Jesus Christ, that we need to learn to submit our will to him. You need to bring your will to him. Don't run away from God. He's not going to kill you. Okay? God wants to make you a blessing to the rest of the people here and in the world. The thing is this. You need to just get your will and put it in his hand and say, Father, you know what? I have never been wanting to be this or to do this, but I know you have been talking to me, you have been speaking to my heart, you have been calling me. You know what, Father? I know you want to do something good, bring something good out of me. Here is my will. Though my will is very contrary to what you want me to do, Father, I submit it to you anyway. This is the trust God is asking us to have in him. Jesus did it. You know, Father, I don't want to go through that. But if you want me to go through it, and I must go through it. Father, this is my will. Let it be yours. There are so many people here. God just is looking for your will. That you yourself will say, Father, I give it to you. And you will see the amazing things God will do through you. He will bless you. 
you will be so, so, so much of a blessing to the rest of the people in the, in the world. You know what? So many a times our will is contrary to the will of God. There is this story, something happened in Sudan. Um, it was in the military camp, military barracks. It was the training area for the army. And there was this young man named Peter who went to become an officer in the army. And then when he was there, he had a very tough trainer, the guy who was training them. Then one day there was a mess in the camp. And then the trainer saw the mess and then he said, this must be Peter maybe. Then he called Peter. Say, Peter. Peter said, yes, sir. Then his trainer said, come, come over. So Peter came and stood and said, yes, sir. Then the trainer said, Peter, are you, the, are you responsible for that mess? He said, no, sir. The trainer looked at him and said, I, I think you are responsible for that mess. Peter said, no, sir. Peter, are you sure? I did not do anything, sir. And indeed, it was not Peter, it was another person. Then the trainer told him, Peter, I think it is you. He said, no, it's not me, sir. Peter, sit down. Peter said, I'm not sitting down, sir. Peter, sit down. I am not sitting down, sir. And then his trainer said, Peter, for the last time, I am commanding you to sit down. Peter sat down. But this is what Peter told his trainer. He said this. He said, sir, physically, I am sitting. But in my heart, I am still standing. <laughs> it happens to so many Christians when we go before God and we say, God, I give you all, I surrender all to you. We sing it, we say it, but actually in our heart, we have not submitted anything to God. Our heart goes a different direction from what actually we say, from what actually we do. This is what we were seeing with Peter. Yes, Peter was right. He was sitting physically, but in his heart, he was not really for his sitting down. He was still standing. Sometimes we are like that. We are in the church, and we actually pray, and we say, God, we are yours. We surrender. We give you all. But in our hearts, we have not. Our will is still our will. When God comes and says, okay, you surrender all, give me your will. Say, no, no, not this God, not, not my will. I, I was just singing. Okay? But our will should be surrendered to our God. He will do amazing things. I feel like there are so many people here God is speaking to this morning. There are so many hearts here which are not surrendered to God. Yes, you are a Christian. You are a committed Christian. But there is something God has been wanting to do in you and through you, but your heart has been yours. You have kept your will for yours, yourself. But God is saying, give it to me. I will do wonderful things. Your will. You know very well your will is contrary to the will of God. Maybe if God takes you from where you are, you are thinking about your money, your career, your business, your whatever. But God is saying, I'm going to make you a better person. Try God. Give him your will. He will transform it. He will conform it to his own will. And you will see the great things God will do through you and in you. Amen? Let's bow our heads in prayer as we ask God to bless our hearts. I believe God has spoken to us. Even me, the preacher, God has spoken to me. And he is asking us to submit our will to him. And we can only do that if we are the people who know how to have fellowship with him through prayer. God is asking someone here to submit, to give him his or her will. God will use it. God will do great things through you. Lord, I thank you for these great people. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for your blessings, oh God, upon us. The blessing of messages like this. When you speak to everyone in the church, oh God, concerning our will. 
we learn from Jesus <coughs> that we need to submit our will to you in prayer. <coughs> Sorry. Father, I pray that you will bless us. Father, I pray that you will change our hearts. Father, I pray that you will change our will. Father, I pray that you will make us be people who will learn to submit our will to you on a daily basis. Because this is when you will be able to transform us to be the people you want us to be. Thank you for your word. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Wasn't that a great word? It's a reminder for us of the power of prayer and the importance of that one-on-one -on -one time with God that we've talked about so much this year, uh, creating a rhythm of relationship in our one-on-one -on -one time. And so I hope the Lord just really uh, kind of uses that in a powerful way. We're going to go into a time of worship now. We're going to some, uh, during the time, this time of worship, where we're receiving our gifts and offerings, I'll ask you to, to stand with me as we, uh, we pray. And, this, uh, and may the Lord just use this time as you reflect on what David has shared with us. Let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful for what you're doing in our church. We're thankful for David, the way that he has come, the message he's brought. And Father, we we especially want to be those people that are aligning our will with your will. And so we pray that during this song, as we, we pray and just ask your Holy Spirit to fill this room in our lives, uh, we pray that you'd meet us in a powerful way as we bring our tithes and gifts and offerings. We pray this in your name. Amen.